Welcome back. Last time we talked a little bit about the osseous structure of the cervical spine and the relationship that the ligamentous structures has in providing static stability. Today I want to spend some time looking at the dynamic stability of the cervical spine and those muscles are responsible for motion both from the bottom up and from the top down. We can look at the muscles in the cervical spine from a, a regional perspective and, and look at um, their orientation, uh, the both the fiber orientation and their uh, attachments and, and insertion. So we'll start looking at the anterior um, view today. And I want to start with just this broad muscle that really is a um, more of a fascial attachment. So it doesn't have a, a big skeletal attachment, but it is one that provides um, motion to the fascia that allows the clearance of, of soft tissue structures. And so that, that muscle is called the uh, platysma. And the platysma has a right and a left. And um, it or, its origins and insertions are on fascial structures. So it starts from the upper part of the pec major and, and deltoid and moves superiorly, superiorly to attach into the mandible and, and the subcutaneous tissue of the lower face. Uh, we can see the, the platysmus when, when we kind of jut our, th our, our, our jaw out and, and we can see that our, our neck raises a, a, a little bit. Um, and it also helps to de depress the jaw a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and take this platysma off and I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that we can see a little closer here. And let's take a look at this, this rather large muscle. And this rather large muscle is the sternocleidomastoid. And the sternocleidomastoid is kind of an, an easy one to remember origin and insertion because it's completely in the name. So I have a, a sternal attachment, I have a clavicular attachment running up superior and lateral to attach into the mastoid process, but this is a really a good representation of an additional attachment coming up and into the occiput. So some authors will describe that this as the SCOM, sternocleidooccipital mandibular muscle. So when I look at the the muscle itself, I can see that it is um, primarily flexes the the um, shoulder, the head down to the shoulder on the same side, so it's a lateral flexor. It rotates to the contralateral side, and it assists in in elevating the thorax. So this will be an, a, an accessory breathing muscle, and we'll talk uh, at, at a point down the road about about breathing and, and accessory breathing muscles. So we have some strap type muscles as well in the anterior aspect and these are kind of muscles that are uh, important in helping us swallow. So we have a sternohyoid muscle we have an omohyoid muscle. This is kind of an interesting muscle um, in that it has a tendinous strap in the middle and becomes a muscle again to insert into the superior angle of the, of the um, scapula. And these are typically hyoid depressors. Now I have my deep neck flexor muscles and the longus coli, the vertical fibers of the longus coli. As I look from a lateral view, I can see 
that this is a pretty deep muscle. So this is not a muscle that we are going to spend um, a whole lot of time trying to palpate. It's going to be tough for us to get in here and try to palpate this muscle. But it is a segmental cervical stabilizer. So it functions to flex segmentally the cervical spine. And it is called a pre-vertebral, so in front of the vertebral, uh, or in front of the, of the vertebrae. And there is a vertical and an inferior oblique and a superior oblique attachment. So the vertical longus coli runs from the front of the bodies of the upper three thoracic and lower three cervical vertebrae and inserts into the front of the bodies of the second, third, and fourth cervical vertebrae. So it's going to flex and it's going to slightly rotate the spine. The other deep neck flexor is the longus capitis running from the base of the occipital bone. It's fairly short and broad above and narrow as it, as it comes down. So it moves from the anterior tubercle of the transverse process of the third to the sixth vertebrae and moves upward and inserts into the base of the occipital bone. And it's responsible for flexing the neck and rotating the head. We took a little look at the muscles from the anterior approach, and now I want to look at some similar muscles, uh, some some the same, and and we'll add a few from a lateral perspective, and then we'll we'll move into that posterior aspect. But again, looking from a, a lateral view, um, as we talked about earlier, the the sternocleidomastoid, and I'm going to take that, kind of remove that, and move it out of the way since we already really talked about um, what that muscle does. And now I can start to see a little bit deeper and, and we can begin to appreciate the amount of neurovascular activity that occurs um, through the cervical spine and how impingements on any of these structures can, can create symptoms all the way down to uh, fingers and, and, um, and down in the chest wall and, and, and upper back. So, Lots of things can happen in, in the cervical spine. So let's take a look at what else I've got um, looking, kind of looking at here. And, and we did talk a little bit about the omohyoid. And remember, that's that guy that has a tennis attachment at the hyoid, becomes muscular, becomes a tendon, and then becomes a muscle again as it inserts into the superior angle. Now I'm going to take a look at what I can see from a kind of posterior lateral and, and um, one of our our big cervical shoulder thoracic spine movers is the trapezius muscle and as I look at the at the trapezius we can really divide the trapezius up into um, into sections. Some people will describe it as an upper, a middle, and a lower trap. Some people will call it the trap one, two, three, and even four. So some some researchers researchers have divided it into into four divisions. Uh, functionally, I like to look at it in terms of what it does um, from its three major parts. So I'll look at the upper, the middle, and the lower trap, and we can see that the uh, origin of the trapezius is on the occipital bone so it has an origin along the nuchal line and has some attachments into the ligamentum nuchae and the spinous processes from T1 all the way down to T12 when I look at the um, origin from the lower trap and we'll come back to that lower trap 
in when we talk about shoulder function next time. It inserts into the lateral third of the clavicle, the chromium, and the spine of the scapula. So again, depending on, on what division we're talking about, will dictate where it attaches. So we can see that the upper fibers come down and attach along the clavicle into the acromion and then all the way along the spine of the scapula and has a significant impact on both shoulder function, shoulder dysfunction, cervical motion, and cervical dysfunction. So it's innervated by a um, branch off of C3, C4 that contributes to the accessory nerve, which is a cranial nerve, uh, cranial nerve 11. Um, so the trapezius is a little bit different in terms of its uh, nerve innervation coming off of uh, the cranial nerves. So again, what we typically think of is as um, a shoulder or a scapular mover when the scapula is stable, it creates spine extension bilaterally. It creates um, lateral flexion and rotation away, um, head rotation away. So when I take that muscle out, I'm going to kind of align this here a little bit better. And I can come down and, 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 and take a look. And what I'll do on the left side is leave that, that uh, trapezius muscle intact so we can get a, a, a better feel for what we're looking at in terms of um, depth. And this is the splenius capitis. And splenius capitis is a cervical rotator uh, to the same side. So it's an ipsilateral rotator, cervical rotator. And it begins on the ligamentum nuque and the spinous processes um, and attaches into the mastoid process and part of the occipital bone. So we can see how it will provide extension is part of the, this group of posterior uh, triangle, posterior triangle of muscles. Um, and has a, a uh, significant component to spinal stabilization, to, to cervical stabilization. So again, bilaterally, we're going to look at, at extension. Unilaterally, we'll look at rotation. The semispinalis capitis, we have lateral and we have medial portions. So let's take a look. I like to put our definition up so that we can see it. Raise that up a little bit. So again, these are, are groups of muscles. So they're uh, groups of fasciculi that provide stability posteriorly. Uh, they originate on the, on the transverse processes of the, um, you know, the upper thoracic and, cervical and, the, and lower uh, cervical vertebrae. And they insert into the, um, along the nuchal line of the occipital bone. So again, they, they extend the cervical spine. They draw the head posteriorly. They, they create lateral flexion. So all of these functions work in synergy with the other intrinsic um, spinal muscles. So this is, is what our, our medial fascic uh, fascicles look like. And here is our lateral. Uh, fascicles. So we can hide those. And now we are going to look at the longissimus capitis. And the longissimus capitis 
is primarily responsible for extension and lateral flexion and aids in some rib compression. So it runs the whole length from the posterior surface of the transverse processes and the accessory processes and inserts along the the posterior margin of the mastoid process just below the, the splenius capitis and the sternocleidal mastoid. And the innervation for all of these is really the dorsal root of, of each of the spinal segments that it, that it is next to. So here we can see this nice long splenius services. And we can see how deep it is falling deep to the posterior serratus superior and the uh, and the upper uh, the, the rhomboid major and rhomboid minor. So again an intrinsic muscle starting on the spinous processes and inserting on the transverse process of C1 and um, to C3. So we can see this little bony attachment. That's the transverse process of C1. And we can see a, a number of muscles that attach to, to that spinous process, or excuse me, to that transverse process. It really supports the, the head in, in, in that erect position, draws the head slightly back or slightly rotates it um, to the same side, so it's a lateral rotation. And we talked about our multifidi starting in the lumbar spine and working up through the thoracic spine and here is our multifidi through the cervical spine. So our, our multifidi have um, one other kind of unique characteristic in the cervical spine in that as we remember and look at the facet joint in the cervical spine, one of the things that is unique to the facet joint in the cervical spine is there is a meniscus similar to the meniscus in the knee at each joint. And sometimes that meniscus, although it's not as well defined as the meniscus in the knee, sometimes that meniscus will fold a little bit and get stuck. And if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night and you can't turn your head, you wake up and say, oh man, I slept wrong. And you go to turn your head to the right and, you, and it won't move. It feels like there's a, a, a bony block. Sometimes it's that meniscus that gets stuck. The multifidi in the cervical region have a muscular attachment into that capsule. And we can use that menisc that multifidi muscle in, in a contract relax um, treatment to actually pull that meniscus back in place and, and relieve that um, relieve that bony or that, that soft tissue block and and re and re and return normal range of motion in the semispinal services we talked a little bit about um, but let's pull up the the services and we can see that it's T1 to T6 transverse processes moving up to insert along the spinous processes of C2 to, to C7. So we can see that we can see that coming all the way coming all the way down and then attaching ultimately into the um, into the transverse processes so we can start to see those attachments so so we get contralateral uh, rotation 
but we really get um, but we really get extension um, and that that uh, drawing of the head posteriorly and and that's that motion that you can kind of imagine your heads on a on a shelf and you're gonna slide your chin forward and slide your chin back um, to allow that motion to occur so it's it's kind of a a translatory motion as opposed to a rotary motion that occurs. Now let's come back up. I'm going to rotate a little bit because this gives us a little bit better view. And here we have a triangle of muscles. We have the oblique capitis superior, which is an intrinsic muscle that attaches from the upper surface of the of the transverse process of C1 and inserts in the occipital bone between the superior and the inferior nuchal lines. And it extends the head and flexes the head to the ipsilateral side. So I get a uh, lateral flexion and I get an extension. So it's, if I want to look up over my, my shoulder slightly, look up over my shoulder, that muscle is going to be responsible for, for that. The obliquus capitis inferior runs from the spinous process of C2 to insert onto the transverse process of C1. So we have a muscle running diagonally from C1 to C2. And it's going to rotate the head and the first cervical vertebrae. So remember the action of uh, the motion between C1 and C2 is very rotary along the the between the dens uh, and and the um, and the atlas and so with the contraction of this muscle it helps to rotate to the ipsilateral side and then the rectus capitis posterior major runs from the spinous process of C2 and inserts into the inferior nuchal line of the occipital bone. So that creates extension and rotation of the head. So when I look at this, this posterior view, I have these obliquus capitis superior, the obliquus capitis inferior, the rectus capitis posterior major, and I have one other uh, muscle in this kind of triangle is kind of uh, left out of the out of the loop a little bit, and that's the rectus capitis posterior minor, which runs from the posterior arch of the atlas and inserts onto the medial inferior nuchal line of the occipital bone. And this is going to provide a little bit of extension, but it is probably more important in providing that proprioceptive feedback to the brain of kind of where we are in, in space. Okay, so now I have a group along the side here that, that we can visualize a little bit better. And this is the levator scapula. And we will we'll, we'll touch on the levator scapula today a little bit because it, it um, does it you know laterally extend, you know laterally flex and and mildly extend the um, the head and the neck with a fixed scapula. But we typically think of of its action on the scapula. So it originates from the transverse processes of C1 to all the way down to C4. It inverts in the superior um, angle of the scapula. And again, normally, in a un, when the scapula is not fixed, it's elevating or stabilizing the scapula. But when the scapula is fixed, it will it will aid in cervical motion. So we talked a little bit before about the iliocostalis uh, thoracis. Just as a reminder, we can see it um, where it comes up and and inserts into the 
angles of the upper six, six ribs um, and the seven cervical vertebrae. So I have a group of, of scaling muscles and I'm going to rotate this around a little bit and move, move my model a little closer. So now I'm kind of looking slightly down and slightly in kind of anterior lateral looking in, in, in a superior to inferior view. And I see the scaling ant this anterior scaling muscle. And the scaling is a accessory breathing muscle, uh, lateral flexor of the neck. It starts at the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cervical vertebrae on the transverse process, inserts on the inner border of the first rib. So in a fixed cervical spine, I'm going to get rib elevation. So this becomes an, an important accessory breathing muscle. But when I look at the anterior scaling and compare it to the middle scaling, which also attaches to the lower six cervical vertebrae, C2 to C7, and inserts on the upper surface of the first rib, I have a a little bit of a difference in the two attachments of these muscles uh, at their insertion. And coming out between those two muscles is the brachial plexus. So I have a trunk of, of nerves coming out that, that innervate the whole upper, uh, upper right quarter in this picture. So it also functions to elevate the rib and laterally flex the head. So now I have yet another accessory breathing muscle and then lastly, I have the posterior scaling muscle, which innervate, or which, excuse me, which runs from C5 to C7 along the posterior tubercles of the transverse process and inserts on the outer surface of the second rib. So it elevates the first and the second ribs and also laterally flexes the cervical spine. So that highlights kind of those major cervical muscles. And we can look one more time through the, you know, as I've, I've removed some of these at uh, the longest coli, uh, the inferior, um, oblique portion of the longus coli and the longus capitis. And those are those anterior cervical and, and capital flexor muscles. So we can see that I have a, a number of muscles that would run posterior to an axis and a number and just a few muscles that run anterior. So those are the, the an example of the muscles that are providing both dynamic stability and mobility and mobility to the cervical spine. So let's take a look at in motion how those muscles work. Having taken a look at the muscles that provide dynamic stability and, and mobility to the cervical spine, let's take a look at, at them in action a little bit and kind of isolated at, uh, coordinated action and We'll start with neck flexion so we can get an idea of what's responsible and, and neck flexion is, is kind of interesting because we have both neck flexion and capital flexion and sometimes we'll have capital extension during neck flexion and that sometimes creates a bit of a problem. But when I look at the muscles responsible for neck flexion, I've got again the sternocleidomastoid with its nice broad attachment and we can take a look and spin that around a little bit and see what they look like working together. And then we have 
in addition to we have those strap muscles so there's the longus coli we have the longus capitis the anterior scalene and the inferior uh, oblique portion of the longus coli. So that's an example of what muscles are responsible primarily for neck flexion. So now we can take a look at lateral flexion and get an idea of what muscles are responsible for lateral flexion. And, and lo and behold, there we have our sternocleidomastoid muscle again. And it's a important muscle in, in neck function in terms of flexion, lateral flexion, and rotation. So as I rotate around a little bit, I start to see a much broader array of muscles responsible for lateral flexion. The splenus capitis, the splenus cervicis, the iliocostalis thoracis, the iliocostalis cervicis, the longissimus thor thoracis, the scalene posterior, the, sc the uh, middle scalene, and the anterior scalene. So these are all important flexors of the cervical spine. And I can even look at, although they probably aren't contributing a tremendous amount, but the intertransverse, the intertransversarii anteriors, and they're innervated probably with more proprioceptors giving our, our brain feedback on where we are in space. But this is kind of a nice view of, of our scaling uh, anterior, and we can see that they're pretty, pretty uh, strappy fasciculi in, in nature. Um, the, and then the, the, uh, the middle scalings. So again, on this side, you can see the middle scaling being stretched by contralateral cervical lateral flexion. Okay, so let's take a look at cervical rotation. And we can see that, um, again, that sternocleidomastoid muscle is an important cervical rotator. And as it shortens, we can see how it will pull the mastoid process in line with the sternum. So it's responsible for contralateral rotation. So if I look right at my left, sternocleidomastoid muscle is gonna be responsible for, for bringing that head around. Now I'm gonna to continue to spin around here and so I can see from a more posterior uh, projection. And we can start to see what muscle is the semispinalis. We can see how it's going to, to shorten and, and, and pull the head. The semispinalis capitis, the posterior scalenes, the middle scalenes. And what I'm not visualizing here are those small deep, that deep triangle of muscles. Uh, the the obliques, the um, head rotators that we uh, that we saw um, in that deeper dissection. Well, I don't have a good visual of cervical extension, so we're just going to review cervical extension quickly um, from static pictures, and and we can see that that our 
extensors Our extensors include the uh, the splenius capitis, the semispinalis capitis, and let's move some things out of the way here. Okay, so we can see how these are going to extend. The splenius cervicis will be a, a cervical extender. The longissimus capitis is, is, is a extender of the head uh, as well as the as well as the neck. And as I spoke about with rotation, we want to make sure that we do visualize the oblique capitis inferior, the oblique, the rectus capitis posterior major, the rectus capitis posterior minor, and the oblique capitis superior. So that's where we're at. We want to continue uh, looking at those extensors, and um, and that should kind of take care of us for uh, for the section on cervical spine.